Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with the fourth lecture on the respiratory system during week six of Anatomy and Physiology 2. In this lecture, um, I'll discuss two topics related to the respiratory system. The first is uh, how pulmonary function is assessed. Um, that includes conducting air to the lungs. Um, a little bit about how um, gas exchange is performed or measured. And then we'll look at respiratory disorders. So how do we assess pulmonary function or the function of the respiratory system? There's various tools that clinicians can use. And um, the primary one is, is called spirometry. And in spirometry, what happens is a patient breathes into a tube that you can see right here that's hooked up to a computer. Now, this is a really specialized device that can measure airflow rates and quantities. And then there's um, a display as far as the volume or the rate that's shown on a computer screen. It's really quite sophisticated. Um, but even more sophisticated than that is that um, we can assess how much air is residual in the respiratory system, meaning not involved with gas exchange, um, using this tool, which is called pulmonary plethysmography. And what it um, requires is that the patient be sitting in a chamber where you can control the atmospheric pressure and you know exactly what the pressure is on the outside of the body and you can measure the whether or not air is going in or out and therefore um, what the pressure is on the inside of the lungs with this um, meter right here. If you if you don't control atmospheric pressure, there's no way for you to determine the dead space or the air that remains always in the in the respiratory system. Um, and we aren't going to get into the um, physics of how it works. And you really don't even have to remember that word. But I do want you to know spirometry because we're going to analyze some spirometry results together, both in lecture and lab. And there's also another tool that's available. It's, it's called measuring diffusion capacity. And what that means is, well, essentially what you're trying to do is measure how much oxygen the blood is able to take from the lung or how much carbon dioxide can be exhaled, either one. But mainly we look at O2 intake. So um, the patient is given um, a gas that is um, similar to oxygen in that it binds to hemoglobin. So the patient inhales this gas and then exhales over a couple of cycles. And then they measure how much of this marked gas that was that they started with, sorry, up here, the inhaled air, how much comes back out. And so you'll have a good idea of what remains in the bloodstream and got and crossed over from the lungs. Uh, we won't be able to talk about that very much until we talk about gas exchange. But I just wanted you to know that there's a way to measure how well we can take up oxygen in addition to measuring how much air we move. So a little bit of both. We're going to focus just on spirometry. This is what's typically done initially when any kind of respiratory disorder is um, suspected. There are four specific volumes um, that are measured. They're called four respiratory volumes. And even just one of those <clears throat> can help assess how well a person's breathing. 
in addition, those volumes can be added together to get more information. And when you have two numbers added together, now we don't call it a volume anymore. We call it a capacity. So um, it'll make more sense when we get into specifics. But these four respiratory capacities are combinations of more than one volume. And that will give even further information on how well someone's respiratory system is ventilating, at least. How much air is going in and out. And when we talk about these four respiratory volumes and then the four calculated capacities, we're, we'll use some uh, common or typical values. And the values that we're going to use refer to a 20-year-old 155-pound male. And that's because that's what's in your textbook and what's available. Um, typically, adult females have a little bit um, lower uh, volumes and capacities than males, but that's what we've got, so that's what we're going to use. So without further ado, let's talk about how we measure, or not how, but what we measure when we're doing spirometry. First, we can measure um, how much air moves in and out of the respiratory system with each breath. And that happens to be during quiet, normal breathing. So sitting still, not talking, just restful breaths. It turns out it's about 500 milliliters. This is known as the tidal volume. Now, a person can also then be asked, rather than just breathe quietly, I want you to inhale as much as you possibly can. So that will be measuring the inspiratory reserve on top of the tidal volume. So if you, um, well, anyway, the inspiratory reserve by itself is about 3,100 mils. So it's beyond tidal volume. So a person can actually inhale 3,600, so to speak. Expiratory reserve is also a volume of air beyond tidal volume with forced maximum effort. So the typical value for that is 1,200. Now you don't have to memorize those, okay? But a tidal volume, it's helpful to sort of know that a tidal volume is like half a liter. Okay, so that's a com that's one that's going to be helpful for you to sort of remember roughly what it is. The other volume that we can measure, as I mentioned, not with spirometry, but with that specialized chamber um, where the atmospheric pressure can be controlled, is residual volume. And residual volume is the amount of air that remains in the lungs even after the most forceful expiration. So it's always there. And that's about 1,200 mils. It doesn't mean that that air doesn't change, that so specific molecules will change. Um, they'll be replaced, but there will, that respiratory system will always hold this much air <clears throat> beyond what we breathe in and out. In addition, there's something called anatomical dead space. And this is about 150 milliliters. This air is never available for gas exchange. Okay. And that means that it's air that never reaches the lungs. It's the air that you inhale that stays in the airways. It doesn't get down to the alveoli. So if our tidal volume of a normal inspiration and expiration only th is 500 only 350 mils um, are available for gas exchange now this dead space might increase or decrease but mainly increase uh, with disease okay and so that reduces the volume of air available for gas exchange all right let's look at the results after somebody has
um, performed spirometry and they've um, for a while breathed in and out quietly. Okay. And then they're asked to inspire as much as possible and then exhale as much as possible. What do we see? Well, we see the t a graph and on the left hand side are the milliliters of air that have moved through the device and time is on the x-axis over here time i don't actually know if it really matters what seconds or minutes or anything but that's over time so you can see this tidal volume right here inspire 500 exhale 500 and the same is true right here tidal volume inhale exhale so that's what the patient did but after that first normal breath they were asked to inhale as rapidly and as much as they possibly can so this volume is the reserve inspiratory reserve and the volume lower than tidal volume is the expiratory reserve so i just want to mention one thing okay when we inhale 500 we typically also exhale 500 and that's the same in each one of these tidal volume waves okay inhale and exhale 500. so you can see on this graph that actually somebody could inhale all the way from this number which is about 2500 up to 6000 right so that is something that's calculated it's called a capacity so that's an inspiratory capacity and you can see that it would be 3600 if you add those two numbers together okay now <clears throat> the expiratory reserve again is beyond the tidal volume so from about 2,500 down to 1,000, but it looks like the normal value here is really usually about 1,200. So a person can exhale the 500 and the 1,200. Notice that the inspiratory reserve volume, the extra amount that you can inhale, is a lot bigger than the forcible the the amount that you can exhale forcibly the expiratory reserve volume and that has to do with the fact that inspiring is an active process and you can just contract your muscles harder to get more air in but exhaling it's very difficult because um, a lot of exhalation or expiration is due to just elastic recoil however you can bend over and push on your abdo abdominal muscles and try to squeeze that diaphragm up and exhale a little bit more um, but it's considerably less than the inspiratory reserve and then residual volume is just sort of a typical 1200 that's always present in the lungs Okay, now let's look at capacities because <clears throat> these tend to be uh, very important clinically as well. These are me these are calculated. They're not measured with a device. They're actually, well, the computer does it, but um, they're different volumes added together. So total lung capacity would be the maximum amount of air that can be contained in the lungs, not including dead space. Okay, so total lung capacity would be residual volume plus expiratory reserve plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve. And we're going to go over that again. So it takes into account all that forced inspiration and exhalation. <clears throat> Vital capacity is a volume that's um, frequently measured and it's everything except for the residual volume. So the amount of hair of air that is inhaled and exhaled in one breath with maximum effort. That's what vital capacity is. 
Sometimes it's called functional vital capacity as opposed to total lung capacity, I guess. All right, now the inspiratory um, capacity includes um, tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve. And the functional residual capacity is, of course, the amount of air that remains in the lungs after normal tidal volume. <clears throat> and I apologize, I notice I have a typo here. This says ration of FEV1 over or divided by FEV, FVC. It shouldn't say ration, it should say ratio. So you're basically counting how much of the functional vital capacity can a person exhale forcibly in one second. So FEV is forced expiratory volume measured over one second. So how fast can you exhale? <clears throat> and they compare that to the functional vital capacity. And it tells them a lot about different lung diseases. And we'll get there. We're still just learning these different definitions. So let's look at this graph considering both the volumes that can be measured and the capacities that can be calculated. So we have our normal tidal volume right here, TV of 500. And if you add that to the inspiratory reserve that we've already talked about, that is the inspiratory capacity the capacity that someone has to inspire that volume, okay? So it's about 3,600. And <clears throat> the um, total lung capacity, I'm going to do that one next. The total lung capacity includes that amount plus how much they can forcibly exhale because there's always 500 mils exhaled passively due to the tidal volume, but if you contract your abdominal muscles and you push really hard, you can actually exhale more than that. So you add those three together, plus you add the residual volume that never actually moves out of the airway. So that's total lung capacity, and of course it's always the largest number. Total lung capacity is always the largest. Anatomical dead space at 150 is always the lowest number. And tidal volume is the second lowest. Okay, not a, not a huge volume. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. This is the functional residual capacity, meaning even when you forcibly exhale, um, that isn't all the air, right? So we know when you forcibly exhale, that's the expiratory reserve volume. That's 1,200. And the residual volume is 1,200. But so there's really capacity of air there that's those two together, and that's 2,400 mils. So that's the functional residual capacity. Now, the last one that I haven't mentioned is actually the one that's calculated the most often, and it's the vital capacity, or sometimes, as I mentioned before, it's called the functional vital capacity. It means how much air can be moved by inhaling maximally, and so that would be from this 2,500 all the way up to 6,000, and then exhaling maximally with forced effort and so that would go down all the way past the tidal volume to that expiratory reserve so you would add expiratory reserve tidal volume and inspiratory reserve together to get vital capacity you know it's a little bit confusing so when you calculate these respiratory capacities, it's almost like having an equation. And we know that the total lung capacity 
you add all four respiratory volumes together. So you're going to need the tidal volume. You're going to need the inspiratory reserve, the expiratory reserve, and that amount that always stays in the lungs, the residual. So this is the equation for that. Total lung capacity equals TV, IRV, ERV, and RV. And vital capacity, I guess there's an equation for that as well. That's everything except residual volume. Notice that's not in the equation. So vital capacity or functional vital capacity, you don't take into account the residual volume that doesn't move in and out of the airway. Okay, and then um, the inspiratory capacity is um, when you add both quiet inspiration and forced inspiration. So that equals tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve. And then the functional residual capacity is the expiratory reserve plus the residual volume. I know it seems like a lot of equations, but the only two that you're really going to use are these top two for the most part. Okay, let's look at a few things about spirometry. Sometimes people refer to spirometry, spirometry as pulmonary function tests, PFTs. Spirometry, the picture I showed of you know, with a young man breathing in the um, apparatus, the spirometer, is the most common lung function test. Okay, It measures the volumes and the rate of flow, which we aren't going to talk about too much except for that FEV1. And then the capacities are calculated by a computer. That's the most common. Okay, And if you want to know residual volume, for the purpose of being able to calculate someone's total lung capacity, because you can't know the total lung capacity unless you know this residual volume, the air that's always sitting in there, um, you have to have a sealed chamber and whatnot. So that uses plethysmosography, becoming full is what that means. Okay, now I'm going to introduce um, the concept of that ratio I mentioned before, and that's FEV1 over forced vital capacity or functional vital capacity. So a very common measurement to determine what kind of lung disease a person has is to measure um, what their vital capacity is and then see how much of that they can exhale in one second, okay? And normal should be quite high. You should be able to exhale about 75 to 85% of the air in your respiratory system after you have forcefully, as much as you possibly can, inhaled. So you inhale as much as you possibly can, and then you exhale. And you do it quickly. You try to do it as fast as possible. Um, that's what the technician will tell you. And they measure how much you can do in one second. And it should be between 75 and 85%. Okay, so how is all of this used? Well, I guess one pulmonary function test can't really diagnose a very specific disease. If you have multiple tests done over, you know, periods of months, they will have a better idea. And then, of course, there's imaging tests and blood tests, that kind of thing. But what pulmonary function tests can really do is evaluate the loss of respiratory function over time. And that usually happens after you have been diagnosed with some sort of disease, which would require imaging, etc. But what these measurements that we just talked about, the, the volumes that are uh, measured with the tools and then the capacities that are calculated, what they're good at is distinguishing what kind of pulmonary disease you have. Is it obstructive? 
or is it restrictive? And I know that doesn't make sense yet, but we're going to talk about what those mean. An obstructive respiratory disease is one in which the airflow is blocked. So there's some kind of resistance to airflow. And the lung tissue is pretty much okay, meaning it's soft and it actually can expand. But in some cases, if the lung tissue gets too soft, certain diseases, then the alveoli get kind of floppy. So that'll be like this. And so that's a nice open one. They could get smaller and close off still be nice and soft and still expand but they can, you can't exhale very well it's kind of hard to, to describe and I'm going to show you some pictures in a little bit but in obstructive disorders airflow is blocked and it's true that sometimes inhalation is a problem like with asthma for example but most often exhalation is impaired more so that's an obstructive disease a restrictive respiratory disease means that you cannot expand the lungs. So lung compliance is restricted, meaning the lungs aren't elastic anymore. They don't expand as well. They're not compliant to inspiration. And in addition, fitting into this category, is the amount of respiratory membrane of the alveoli is reduced. So there's less gas exchange. Okay, that might be true in obstructive diseases, but it's always true in restrictive diseases. So we're going to categorize a few of those. Okay, and these are the disorders that we're going to talk about in relation to those volumes. A, um, atelectasis, we're going to look at that. Um, pneumothorax, the inventory, or infant respiratory distress syndrome. And then the obstructive respiratory disorders that I'll mention to you and talk about are bronchitis, asthma, emphysema, which can really fit into both, truthfully. It could go either way, and I'll explain why. And then COPD, everybody's heard of COPD, and that stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so obviously it's classified as an obstructive disorder. The restrictive disorders that I'll talk about are cystic fibrosis and tuberculosis, just those two. So let's start up here. Um, this actually will not really involve lung volumes or capacities. It's going to harken back to the anatomy you learned of the lung and why the lung moves with the thoracic wall. So um, atelectasis is um, the word that means collapsed lung. And you can see that in the diagram up there. You've got one lung that's, you know, pretty well the size of that pleural space, but this one's collapsed, okay? And that that is not normal, that degree of reduction, nowhere near. It should always be adhered to the thoracic wall. So, in conjunction, sometimes, with a collapsed lung, you will have air in the intrapleural space. That means between the visceral and parietal layers, uh, uh, membranes, right? The pleural membrane has a visceral layer and a parietal layer. And so when you, when the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura have air in between them, it can mean that the parietal pleura was punctured in some way, and so atmospheric air got in there. It could mean that the visceral pleura was damaged in some way, and probably alveoli as well. And so if that layer gets damaged, you might get air coming in from the alveoli, so rupture of the visceral pleura rupture of the parietal pleura. But in addition, you can get collapse of a lung um, or a telectasis when there's very severe bronchiole obstructions. So we have little bronchioles here 
And if they are obstructed and air is not allowed to escape, you can't exhale it. Okay, not allowed, doesn't happen. Then <clears throat> what happens is the air in the alveoli get trapped and that air moves, it gets absorbed into the intrapleural space. But mainly I like focusing on the fact that the, the pleural membranes are super important. Um, and if you rupture either one of those, your lung is not going to be able to expand um, and uh, reduce like no, with normal breathing. It just, it won't be able to happen. Okay. So um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is how airway can, airway resistance and obstructive disorders go together. But I, I first want to talk about um, this idea of a collapsed alveolus. So factors that can increase alveolar surface tension, which if you remember, the surface tension is due to the fact that there's surfactant in here, a detergent that make sure that the walls of the alveoli do not adhere to one another even during exhalation. Any disorder that lowers surfactant means that upon exhalation these um, alveolar walls will be closer together and they're more likely to adhere. And what the real problem is is that <clears throat> they tend to get floppy because there's um, right here at this airway, this bronchiole, there's a blockage at this spot right here. And they kind of bend funny. And so you can't even get inhalation anymore, right? So this is where the idea that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease has what's known as air trapping. And it means that this air has gotten stuck in the alveolus and it can't get out. But what's probably um, more familiar to, at least to parents, is that premature babies often develop a respiratory disorder called infant respiratory distress syndrome, syndrome or IRDS, and these premature babies don't have a completely developed respiratory system, and therefore the cells that normally produce surfactant aren't mature yet, and so there's less surfactant, and so you tend to get these collapsed alveoli in um, premature infants. That's very treatable though, you can just um, give them um, kind of a nasal spray or a mouth spray um, during their inhalation that works its way down to the alveoli and it mimics surfactant. So there's a drug that can treat that, which is good. Okay, so obstructive disorders in general are any, any kind of disease or disorder that increases airway resistance. And that would be true in the case of COPD when you have that kind of collapsed alveolus that bends funny and the air gets trapped. But probably a more common um, cause of you know, airway resistance is the accumulation of mucus um, or um, it could be bronchoconstriction where the bronchi or the bronchioles due to the presence of smooth muscle narrow or constrict. So any respiratory disorder that causes mucus accumulation will be an obstructive disorder. An example would be bronchitis inflammation of the bronchi or the bronchioles really. Maybe a tumor grows and causes an obstruction or causes mucus accumulation, and then chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as well. It turns out that chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease is linked with 
smoking and um, when uh, I found a link between smoking and a reduction in surfactant as well as an increase in mucus production. So all sorts of problems with smoking. Okay, the other category would be bronchoconstriction, right? So that would be an obstructive respiratory disorder. And this happens when irritants are inhaled and detected. So the airway detects these um, irritants and a signal is sent to the brain and then the parasympathetic nervous system sends output to the bronchi and says contract okay so the irritants stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and cause bronchoconstriction there is also an example of asthma which really is a hypersensitive airway in this case not only do you get bronchoconstriction due to some sort of an irritant or an allergen but this allergen causes histamine release by certain blood cells and that histamine travels all over your body and um, histamine we usually think of as vasodilator but it, it is a severe bronchoconstrictor so this is a situation where you have um, histamine release in the lungs there are mast cells that have gone to the lungs and release the histamine and so you get severe bronchoconstriction let's look at pictures it's easier to understand with pictures here's some examples of obstructive respiratory disorders so here's mucus accumulation down here on the bottom right this happens with bronchitis and asthma and that has increased resistance so airflow in either direction is hampered and your respiratory volumes will go down you won't be able to inhale or exhale quite as much without force or without effort anyway <clears throat> you might get wheezing right and um, then the air is still flowing of course but maybe not quite as fast now let's look at uh, COPD and emphysema because it can really they well okay let's just look at COPD so here's a nice healthy set of alveoli this is the tertiary well that's probably the terminal bronchiole sorry that's the terminal bronchiole so air is coming in okay now let's look down at COPD notice first of all there aren't nearly as many light pink alveoli instead what you have are bigger alveoli these bigger alveoli um, are due to the loss of respiratory membrane so destruction of the wall the walls of some of the alveoli occurs so they the destruction in between alveoli makes a bigger alveolus right and these bigger alveoli are what make it difficult to exhale um, because they get floppy and when we try to exhale when our when our lung reduces its volume they kind of collapse the whole group of these alveoli will collapse and you can't get the air out there's air trapping so the air trapping is what makes emphysema an obstructive disorder and COPD is a wide range of all sorts of things but it includes some of this air trapping okay so the signs and symptoms that you see with obstructive respiratory disor uh, disorders is impaired airflow during inspiration or expiration or both due to mucus inflammation air trapping and I didn't write here but a tumor also it could be a tumor usually especially with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease but in all cases actually obstructive respiratory disorders make expiration 
particularly difficult. And that's because it's a passive process. We can forcibly inhale pretty naturally, but it is hard to do a forced expiration. And even when you do, it's the volume isn't as much. You can't get as much out as you can get in. So what we see um, is an increase in certain volumes. Total lung capacity goes up. And the reason is because in to try to compensate for this problem, your inspiratory capacity went up. Okay, your inspiration goes up. Because you can forcibly do that. So total lung capacity goes up. And if total lung capacity goes up due to inspiratory capacity, so does your um, <laughs> uh, um, sorry, residual volume and your functional residual capacity. But I think the way that people really diagnose it isn't so much based on the hyperinflation because it's not like we take a picture and try to see the hyperinflation and air trapping in the lungs. Instead, what we do is look at flow rates, in particular that FEV1 rate, which is how forced expiration in one second. And what we see is that expiration is difficult. Less than 80%, it should really say 75% of vital capacity can be exhaled in one second. And remember, normal is 75 to 85. So lower than 80%, they start to wonder about obstructive respiratory disorders. But I think it's really a skill in, you know, interpreting all these different volumes. So we're just talking about one way to interpret this. But let's look at um, restrictive disorders next. So factors that decrease any kind of lung compliance, meaning the ability to expand due to elasticity and recoil due to elasticity, cause restrict restrictive disorders. So you're restricted, your inhalation is super restricted. You know, we can forcibly usually do that. But in restrictive disorders, no matter how hard you try, this lung does not have the elastic tissue to expand. So I thought that picture was a good visual for restrictive disorders. The lungs cannot expand normally. This tends to happen when scar tissue builds up around alveoli and um, basically destroys the elastic fibers that surround the alveoli. And the two diseases that um, I know of that um, form this kind of scar tissue is tuberculo R tuberculosis, which is a bacterial thing, and cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic problem. And I wanted to show you this picture down on the left. You've got two healthy uh, respiratory bronchioles right here, leading to multiple alveoli that are still healthy. One there, and then there's one down here. And in between, notice that beige tissue. That's scar tissue. Even if there's healthy alveolus beneath it, alveoli beneath it, that scar tissue right there makes it difficult for the alveoli to expand because the elastic fibers surrounding the outside of the alveoli are damaged. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, the signs, symptoms, or causes, I guess, of restrictive respiratory disorders. So that connective tissue problem is called interstitial fibrosis, the scarring between the alveoli. And therefore you have a reduction in elastic fibers and the lung tissue becomes stiff and non-compliant, can't expand. So in this case, the opposite of obstructive disorders is true. And that is that inspiration is more impaired than expiration. And so if you can't inspire as much, your total lung capacity goes down. Your functional vital capacity goes down basically because your inspiratory capacity went down.
or inspiratory reserve volume went down. One of the herbs, the I herb, inspiratory reserve volume. And the other factor that's kind of interesting is that exhalation isn't so bad. Normal FEV1 tends to happen. Um, but that's kind of mm, a judgment call because if you think about it, the elastic fibers have um, less elasticity. So recall, recoil would go down. So you would expect FEV to be not quite normal, but because expansion never happened, I think you don't really measure um, elastic recoil because there wasn't any elastic stretch or compliance. Anyway. We'll talk about this in lab quite a bit. So let me show you some pictures of those two disorders. So we already know what the interstitial fibrosis looks like. That's what this picture is on the left. The purple region is the scar tissue. Okay. And normally, you know, those alveoli would kind of be touching each other, but, or groups of alveoli, but they would have elastic fibers in between them. So um, what we see in tuberculosis is that there's an infection um, with the bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis, that infects and starts residing in the lung. And these bacteria create granulomas that surround themselves. And then on top of the granulomas, they're sort of encased in this protein layer, then the lung and the body in general responds by making fibrous connective tissue. And that fibrous connective tissue destroys and replaces the elastic fibers. So that's what happens in tuberculosis. And let's look at what happens in cystic fibrosis. As I mentioned, this is a genetic disorder that makes inspiration difficult. And um, the genetic disorder involves the mutation of a gene. So there's a gene mutation. And what the gene codes for is a chloride ion channel in the respiratory membrane, okay, in the epithelial cells. And if it's a chloride ion channel that's mutated, that means that chloride isn't going to move a cord, move very well across the cell membrane. And so what that does is change um, salt concentrations on either side of cells. Sodium and chloride tend to go together, so think that way. And it also changes the water movement across membranes. So normally, you remember that our respiratory airway, especially in the trachea, has a lot of mucus making cells and glands. And mucus requires water. And, you know, the, the mucus is going to go out into the airway, right, to trap some sort of irritant or inhalant. But presumably, the mucus level is controlled by salt and water balances. And if those are impaired, then you get mucus that's super sticky and thick and you can't cough it out. <clears throat> like we normally clear our throats all the time, right? And there's that mucociliary escalator that I talked about. The thick, sticky mucus, you cannot just clear your throat and get it out. So the mucus tends to stay in there, and it's a perfect harbor for uh, infectious agents, um, bacterial infections. If it, cystic fibrosis, of course, since fibrosis is part of the word uh, or the disease name, you'll also get some scarring of lung tissue. This is just in the airway I'm showing you here, but if we looked in the lung, um, you'd the mucus would eventually get down into the lungs. The, there'd be an inflammatory response and fibrous tissue would form. So cystic fibrosis is pretty serious. Okay, now I just have a summary of these pulmonary diseases or respiratory diseases.
for um, classifying a disorder as obstructive or restrictive, I find these bits of information the most helpful. In obstructive disorders, remember that expiration is impaired more. So that means you can forcibly inhale usually past an obstruction. So that increases your total lung capacity. And some of that is residual. It's not going to help much, but total lung capacity. So if expiration is more impaired and you have a high lung capacity, and you've me measured the FVC, we can do that. That's usually higher as well. What you'll see is that since the FEV is so low, even though the functional vital capacity is higher because you have higher lung capacity, the ratio is low. So when you see a ratio below 80% of FEV1 expiration to the functional vital capacity, you start thinking obstructive. Now restrictive disorders would be the opposite. Total lung capacity is decreased, remember, because inspiration is impaired, not expiration. So when we when a person with restrictive disorders exhale, the FEV1 is usually normal. So that's normal, FEV1, expiration in one second. But the FVC, which is linked to total lung capacity, is low. It's very low. It's so low that it turns out the normal FEV1 appears higher than it really is, if you think about it, I guess. I don't know. It's normal. But the ratio will be over 80%. Okay. Ah, I see another error here. Ah. Uh, Okay, due to low FVC, right there, FVC. Before I post this, I'll make sure the slide is accurate. So due to low FVC, functional vital capacity. Okay, that's all for this lecture. That's the end of week six. Sorry I took so long. Thanks for listening. Bye.